So my name is Alba Dit Munoz and I work at the EMBL in Heidelberg, Germany. And it is a pleasure for me uh, today to be able to share with you uh, our results on how cellular and extracellular mechanics are important for pluripotency and development. And so the first thing I want to do is I want to thank the organizers for giving me this chance. And so I come from an institution that is very well known uh, for imaging. And so we are being hammered down, seeing is believing. And it is clear that new technology actually enables new biology. Uh, what you're seeing here is uh, an automatic segmentation of the plasma membrane of an immune cell uh, from a 10 nanometer isotropic resolution FIPSEM data set. And sure, seeing is really cool. It's really beautiful. Biology generates shapes that we would have never been able to, to think about. But to really understand the origin of this stunning topology, uh, we cannot only focus on how the cell looks like, but we actually have to measure the physical forces and material properties at the cell surface. For decades, our understanding of physiology has largely focused on biochemical reactions. Things like ligand binding to a receptor, phosphorylation, nuclear translocation. And we have come to realize that those signaling networks actually drive the assembly of the cytoskeleton, which in turn has certain mechanical properties. But what we now know is that those mechanical properties feed back into the signaling cascades and actually can also direct cell shape and behavior. And so what we try to do in the lab is we try to understand how those feedback mechanisms occur. And one might wonder, well, why do we actually study cell mechanics? And so I think the, the most obvious basic research kind of answer is because cell function follows form. If you want to act as a neuron, you need to look like a neuron. And in order to do that, you need the cytoskeleton and certain mechanical properties at the cell surface that allow you to take that shape. But as uh, Paolo has just shown us um, um, from his fluid uh, mechanics perspective, we have come to realize that actually uh, for, for a lot of uh, pathological processes, its prognosis and development depends on mechanics. And so the example that I like to give is actually very fitting to today's seminar. Uh, because it, it's the response of how endothelial cells respond to shear flow. And so wherever there are bifurcations in vasculature or any bending, this leads to unsteady flow. And, and it's exactly there that you're going to find the onset of arteriosclerosis. And so as I mentioned in the lab, we are really focused on the cell surface. And, and we try to really understand what mechanical properties are cells sensing, how and why they do that. And I will show you two stories today. In one, we make use quite extensive use of our atomic force microscope to measure those mechanical properties. And in the other one, I will show you, we've been working uh, hard in trying to implement brilliant microscopy for, for um, live cell imaging. And so we really focus on understanding how these mechanical properties and physical forces affect cellular signaling cascades, which in turn control behavior. And, and very importantly, because this is not a one-way street, um, we really want to understand a better, uh, better how this crosstalk works. And so I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview. Um, the stories that I will show you today are, are focused on, on zebrafish and on mouse embryonic stem cells, but we also have quite a bit of work in the lab using immune cells. What you see here is, an, is a neutrophil-like cell. It's, it's from a cell line called HL60. We also use primary uh, T cells from blood donations, uh, and we really study their motility. As I will show you a little bit in a bit, uh, we also make extensive use of mouse embryonic stem cells. And, and what you see here is this amazing transition between what is a naive prime, uh, a naive mouse embryonic stem cell and, and a prime one, uh, which are both still pluripotent, but, but they have this radical change in shape and, and also in, in their capacity to, to contribute to chimeras. And a part of the lab that I won't have time to discuss today um, really focuses on, on fibroblasts and how they control their shape and also on primary human tissues. Um, but uh, if any of those uh, topics uh, are relevant to you, I'm, I'm always happy to, to discuss them. And so, okay, we focus on cell surface mechanics. And, and if we think about the field, what has people studied? Well, people have mainly focused on forces propagated within the cytoskeleton. What you see here are the microtubules on the left. I'm very, dis I'm not very good at right and left, on the left. And, and acting on the right in the first hours of division of, of the zebrafish. And, and what you see is that uh, they're very dynamic, they're very powerful, um, and they do lots of really cool things. So, so there's been a lot of research on, on the cytoskeleton. But in a, in a cell, the actual outer boundary is the plasma membrane, and its tension has also been shown to integrate a wide variety of behaviors. And this ranges between the balance between exocytosis and endocytosis, regulating the, the folding state of cabeole, orchestrating cell spraying of phagocytosis, and one of my favorite ones, limiting uh, leading edge formation in migrating cells. 
But what do I mean when I talk about member retention? So, so in a, in a pure lipid system, it's it's easier to understand. It's basically the energy required to expand the surface area in the plane of the pi layer. And so the molecular origin of this in-plane tension is basically the fact that the lipid molecules don't, war, don't want the water to come in. Now, in cells, things are a little bit more complicated because the plasma membrane is very tightly interacting with an underlying actomyosin cortex. And, and so this happens through a, a bunch of uh, different families of proteins, which we call membrane to cortex attachment proteins. And so this membrane to cortex attachment, which is basically like, a, like a, um, an addition between these two structures, also provides resistance to this, to this expansion, to this increase in the, in, the, in the area. And so in cells, we normally talk about apparent membrane tension, which is basically a sum of these two components. And so today I want to tell you a story about this second component, this membrane to cortex attachment. And, and this was really the child of Emble in a way. Um, it was really possible because we had a set of really amazing collaborators. So, so Martin and Sergio in the lab, Martin is a staff scientist, Sergio is a PhD student, um, worked together with three other labs, uh, Evangelia Petsalakis lab at the EBI uh, in Cambridge, the Nevers lab down the, down the corridor from us, and the Hackett lab in Rome um, to, to, to generate this, this beautiful story um, on cell surface mechanics and how, it gate, how they gate embryonic stem cell differentiation. And as I mentioned uh, before, uh, one of the transitions or one of the cell cha shape changes that really interest us um, is this transition between naive pluripotent and prime pluripotent. And so the difference basically is if we compare it to what would happen in an embryo, it's basically cells from the inner cell mass or, or just a little bit after implantations, uh, we can also generate this prime pluripotency. And in reality, what, what those are, are basically um, cells that can generate the three germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. But if you put them back into a blastocyst, the naive pluripotent cells will contribute to the mouse, while the prime pluripotent cells will not. So, so they're a little bit less pluripotent. They're, they're already, they have already transitioned out of this superpower. And so the reason why we were interested in them is because if you look at them, um, what you see is that they transition from growing into this ball, into this colony, and then um, they spread out and extend these protrusions, which for somebody who comes from the migration field like I did, to me, this looked like they were growing a lamellipodia. <laughs> and it's not like they actually move. I mean, they basically just spread out. Um, but this was, to me, screaming cell surface mechanics. So I thought, well, this looks like a really cool system. Let's just take a look. Another reason also to look at uh, mouse embryonic stem cells, or stem cells in general, is, is because of the seminal work of the Disher lab, no? where, where they have shown that for mesenchymal stem cells, depending on which kind of substrate stiffness you would plate them, they would become whatever it resembled that. So if you would plate them on something really soft, the cells would become an adipocyte. Well, if you plate it in something really stiff, the cells would become an osteoblast like bone. And so we knew at least extracellular mechanics matter for differentiation. Our question was, what about intracellular mechanics? And so the first thing that we did was actually measure this apparent membrane tension. And the way that we do this is we use an atomic force microscope to pull a plasma membrane tube. And um, what this gives us is basically this combination of in-plane membrane tension and membrane to cortex attachment. And what we could see is that naive cells have a higher apparent membrane tension than prime cells. And so again, coming from a migration field where when cells spread, their apparent membrane tension increases, to me, this was, this was very puzzling. And so we wondered what exactly is underlying this reduction in apparent membrane tension. And so we decided to do, oops, this is wrongly animated. Um, we decided to do dynamic tether pooling experiments. What we do here is we pull a tether, but we don't let it equilibrate. We keep on pulling, pulling, pulling until the tether breaks. And we do this at different speeds, and then we can fit a mathematical model um, that will then give us a specific measurement of the membrane to cortex attachment parameter. And what we saw is that naive cells have a much higher membrane to cortex attachment than, than their prime counterparts. And so one little secret that I haven't told you is that uh, those different cell types are normally plated on different extracellular matrices uh, when you want to keep them continuously in, in this locked state. And so we wanted to make sure that the extracellular material or, or, or its, its uh, mechanics didn't have any effect, also based on, on the Disher work. And so we decided to, instead of plate naive cells on gelatin and prime cells on fibronectin, which is what the field normally does, to plate everybody on, on something called laminin 511. And so here, the naive cells really stick out and spread out. I mean, they still look different if you look at them with, a, with an electron microscope, but they, they don't look uh, like the round colonies that we had before. 
But what we could see is that irrespectively of what do you play them in, naive cells always have high membrane to cortex attachment. And so no matter whether the chemistry or the mechanics of that extracellular matrix is changed, they still will keep um, this very high membrane to cortex attachment. And so now we have the chicken and the egg question, okay? So does pluripotency depend on membrane to cortex attachment or is pluripotency simply downstream of differentiation? And so in order to, to answer this question, we decided to turn uh, towards uh, endogenous membrane to cortex attachment linkers. And in cells, there's different families, but the really canonical ones are what we call ERM family, esrin, radixin, and maizin. And so this family is really convenient also because it transitions between a folded state and then upon a single phosphorylation, the protein opens up, one side binds to the membrane and the other side binds to actin. And so in such a way, um, you have a single, a sing you can change a single amino acid and basically generate a dominant negative or a constitutively active version of, of such proteins. And this is indeed what we did. Uh, we generated a, a stable cell line that expresses constitutively active esrin in these mouse embryonic stem cells. And so we measured its membrane to cortex attachment and we could see that indeed, if we overexpress constitutively active esrin, we can keep very high membrane to cortex attachment, but that still doesn't answer our question, right? Is it just increasing the mechanics or is it actually affecting fate? And so we followed the whole series of, of different assays to really um, um, assess fate. I'm only gonna show you a couple because of the sake of time. Um, you can find the rest also in the paper and I'm also happy to discuss them later on. But one of, the, one of the tools that I want to show you today is the expression of this canonical naive marker, which is called REX1. And so there is a cell line that already expresses GFP under this promoter. And so we can basically track um, the amount of GFP over time. And so if we go from a naive to a prime, we normally see like a decrease to a half of, of this amount of GFP protein. And now if we overexpress constitutively active esrin, even though we have allowed the cells to exit for 48 hours, they still retain very high levels of this REX protein. And they don't do that if we just express an M-cherry control. Um, this is of course only one gene. And so we wanted to make sure that indeed those cells were functionally more naive. And so to do this, uh, we use this, this assay that we normally call replating assay. And so the idea here is you grab a bunch of naive cells, they're grown in this, in this media that has these inhibitors called 2i lead, which is really stringent and will only, only naive cells will survive. And so you allow them to exit naive pluripotency by taking away those inhibitors. And then you wait a certain amount of time, in our case, 48 hours. And then you grab those cells and you put them back into this very stringent media. And so, any cell that has starting differentiation that has already transitioned to the prime state is gonna die. But all the cells that are still have enough naive identity will remain, will survive, and will grow a colony in something like four to five days. And so what we can do is we can do this experiment with and without the expression of our constitutively active esrin, and we can see how many colonies do we get at the end. And so very interestingly, we could see that indeed, just by the expression of this one protein, constitutively active esrin, um, where that increases membrane to cortex attachment, we get threefold more colonies than with the M-cherry control. Now, it always worried me that esrin is a master regulator of a lot of things in the cells, and it has a lot of signaling domains. So because we do mechanics, we really wanted to know, is this esrin specific or is it membrane to cortex attachment specific? And I'm gonna show you one of these slides that looks like a simple cartoon of something that just was done on the site which is actually two years of the PhD student. And so what Sergio did in the lab is he screened through around 20 plasma membrane binding domains and 10 actin binding domains, made sure that they were completely signaling inert, made them in all kinds of combinations to generate a collection of what we call inert linkers. And so what I'm showing you today is one of those, which, is, which we have named the IMC linker, uh, inert membrane to cortex attachment linker that has uh, a lipidation domain on the plasma membrane binding site. So it's integrated into the plasma membrane. And on the actin binding domain, it has eutrophin, which is really small. And, and from what we have seen so far, um, doesn't have um, too many effects on, on uh, polymerized actin. And so we decided to generate this. It's, it's very much mimicking the structure of endogenous membrane to cortex attachment linkers. And we generated a, a stable cell line again that expressed uh, this construct. And we could see that again, um, it, it's sufficient to keep high membrane to cortex attachment. And not only this, it's also sufficient to keep the cells with high levels of REX GFP, which is not the case when we express either the plasma membrane binding domain alone or the actin binding domain alone. 
And it also leads to the generation of three, four, three, four more colonies in the rescue assay, um, in the replating assay, telling us really that increasing this one mechanical property is sufficient to keep the cells um, in the naive state. And this is why uh, we, we stated that membrane to cortex attachment is a gate uh, for, for the exit from pluripotency. Um, the other two things that I want to mention is we tried to decrease it and see whether that was sufficient to speed at exit. This is not the case. Um, it's, it's clear that there needs to be a network of transcription factors that has to change for exit to occur. So it's a gate really, it's not a door. Um, and the, the other thing that we did is we wanted to make sure that this is not only applying to this one transition between naive and primed, uh, but it might also apply to other developmental stages. And so we grow uh, embryonic bodies uh, basically, the idea here is that you, you grab your cells, you grow them in a ball, and then they spontaneously differentiate and they form the three germ layers. And so we can track uh, the revolution using um, RNA sequencing. And what we see is that even in this much more complex system that actually generates three independent germ layers, we see that when we express either constitutively active esrin or the IM slinker, we increase pluripotency uh, gene expression and we decrease differentiation markers, um, either the new ectoderm or the mesenter. Okay, this was our first story. Uh, the second one is a little bit more technical, uh, but I really wanted to highlight for you this one method in case you've never heard of it. And, uh, and, and also tell you that, that it can be very useful to do really cool biology. And so this has uh, been the product of a very close collaboration we have with the lab of Robert Prevedel, also here at EMBL. And, uh, and it has been really spearheaded by two, a PhD student, Carlo and, and a postdoc, Hector. And so Hector works with zebrafish and, and he's really interested in the development of the notochord. And so this is a structure that it's, it's present in all chordates and it's basically gonna give rise to your intervertebral discs. And so in the first hours of development of, of the zebrafish, this is how it looks like. You have a range of cells, um, um, which are called vacuolated cells, which are labeled in, I don't know if you can see my mouse. Hmm, doesn't matter. Uh, which are basically these, these cells with a giant back wall in the middle and then they're surrounded by an epithelial layer, which are called sheath cells. And so um, these are, these, it's a very interesting structure because it's basically like 1D. And so the, the vacuolated cells are really, this vacuole is really under a lot of pressure. It's basically similar amounts of pressure as there is in like a truck wheel. And so these, these uh, vacuolated cells, basically their, their job is just to produce hydrostatic pressure and the sheath cells around it generate this extracellular matrix layer that basically withstand this. And this is what basically means that makes the fish straight. And so in the previous slide, um, you could see that if you mess up with this vacuolation, the fish end up not being straight and also being much shorter. So this is this, this balance of forces is really important uh, for the growth of the embryo. And so if we now take a closer look at this extracellular matrix layer, we can see that it's really a circumference around, um, around the notochord that has like extremely parallel um, collagen fibers that are very heavily cross-linked. And so we really wanted to measure the mechanical properties of that extracellular matrix. But that's really not trivial, right? Because this is in the center of the fish. And so if we go to like traditional methods uh, to measure uh, tissue elasticity, like an atomic force microscope that I've shown you before, or microplates or micropipettes or whatever you want, um, they, have, they have issues because this structure is not at the surface. And if we use things like micro droplets, which have uh, been uh, very heavily uh, used by, by, for example, the lab of Uje Campas and um, in Santa Barbara, they give you a local measurement, right? It's, it's only wherever the droplet is. And so we Hold look- on. sorry, uh, five minutes. Perfect. Um, we looked around uh, and, and we decided to team up with, with Robert Prevedel, who builds very fancy three photo microscopes and acoustic, uh, photoacoustic microscopes and whatever else. Uh, to try and build a brilliant light scattering uh, microscope. And, and so here the idea is that we can basically, um, in a non-destructive, label-free and contactless way, measure the viscoelastic properties of the extracellular matrix. And so how does this, it sounds like magic, no? And so what basically is happening is that you shine in a laser and then this laser is gonna interact with the thermally induced acoustic modes or phonons that are present in the material. And those are gonna be different in things that have different mechanical properties. And so the majority of those um, is going to be reflected back um, as they're basically not going to interact with the phonons and they're going to be reflected back or scattered back as Rayleigh light. And you're going to have a massive peak of Rayleigh light. But a very small amount, like 10 to the minus 5, of those photons, um, or 10 to the 5, sorry, of, of 1 out of 10 to the 5 of those photons will actually either lose a phonon or gain a phonon. And so if we can capture that, 
we can basically measure the mechanical properties of our sample. And so this has been done in material sciences forever, but it couldn't really be applied to biology because the amount of laser that you had to put in, you would basically fry your sample. And so in the last, let's say five years, uh, with the development of, of something called virtual image phase arrays, which are like fancier spectrometers, basically, we can now implement radio microscopy um, for, for biology. And so this is still, it's, it's like the beginning of confocal microscopy. It's still fairly phototoxic. So you have to be careful of which kind of structures you look and you have to make lots of controls to make sure that your organisms are fine. Uh, but it's, a, it's an extremely powerful method. And so the one thing that I want to just clarify is that what we are measuring with prion microscopy is the longitudinal moduli. And so this is still different than the Young's modulus that you would measure with an atomic force microscope. And so more and more people in the community are really trying to, to calibrate our systems to, to see when are these two things actually um, the same and when are they not? And, and to really understand what it is that we are measuring with prion microscopy. And so let me just like show you some cool images and tell you what, what we've done so far with this method. So, so this is how the notochord looks like, right? So um, you can see that, that we see like a very, a very high values of, of the shift at this, at this uh, um, that, so sorry, the shift is giving you uh, the elasticity and the width is giving you the viscosity. And so if we now focus on the shift, you already see these red uh, lines running next to the vacuolated cells, which is basically the, the, the collagen that the sheet cells generate. So if we take now a closer look, you can really see that that uh, you can see the vacuole is really blue because it's basically close to water because it's basically all fluid. And then you have the sheet cell and then very, with very high shift, you have this collagen layer that I was talking about. And so when we first image, when we first started imaging this collagen layer, we realized that very often it was not like a nice clean peak, but we had like a double peak in many of the cases. And so we did a, a clear characterization of this, um, of whether we were exactly at the ACM layer or just next to the ACM layer. And we could resolve that indeed, if you go horizontally from the outside to the inside, you're basically gonna transition from having a small second peak that becomes bigger and bigger and bigger the more you go in, and then it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller the more you go out. And basically what we could show is that we can measure the thickness of that layer just by the change in the mechanical properties. And this is very much similar to the values that we obtain when we actually fix it and image it with an electron microscope, which I think is really cool. Um, and so the other thing that, that we realized is that uh, in order to do these mechanical measurements, the orientation of your sample does matter. Because as you can see in the, in the schematic, I hope on the right-hand side, you see that the whole voxel is basically covering this ECM. So we can pick up this second peak, this, this change in mechanical properties. While at the top and at the bottom of the notochord, we don't see this because what you are sampling is all the interactions of the phonons and the photons on the whole voxel. And so it's gonna be averaged out if your, if your layer of interest is smaller than the voxel in Z. And so just is something to, to be aware of that, that Brio microscopy is extremely powerful and we can now use it to measure mechanical properties in tissues, but we need to be very careful of uh, the orientation of our sample with respect to the light. And so with this, I want to thank the lab. Um, I want to highlight that the first part of the story, uh, or the first story that I told you about was really spearheaded by Martin and Sergio. Um, and that the second part of the lab uh, was really done by, by Hector and Carlo also in the lab. And that we could not have done any of the things that I have presented you today without our amazing collaborators and our funding sources. And now I thank you guys for listening. Thank you very much for that beautiful talk, Alba. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat that we can uh, we can get to before we go to the informal session. Um, so let's see. The first question here is by from Nancy Ford. Um, if IMC has no participation in signaling, what controls the attachment of IMC to allow release of membrane from cortex, or is this permanent? And there's still a K on and a K off of the eutrophin binding domain to 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 actin. Uh, we cannot control that time scale. And so when we published this paper, um, because we were really trying to understand how can a surface mechanical property affect fate, right? I mean, it's so far away. The nucleus is so far away from the surface. And so luckily we realized that uh, some other group was working on, on, on a similar story. And so we ended up publishing them back, back to back. And so what they could show is that uh, they didn't have our tools or, or, the, or the nice mechanical measurements where we could identify membrane to cortex attachment as the relevant mechanical property. But what they could show, which was really powerful, is that actually endocytosis downstream is affected. 
And so this kind of makes sense, right? If you glue the two things together, endocytosis is going to be simply harder. And so then they could show that endocytosis via F of FGF was actually the, 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 the signal that was then affecting um, fate. I think I have a kind of a follow-up question or related to that is, um, is there a way to modulate the MCAs or the attachment like in real time so you could like modulate like, spatially or like just like turn it on and off yeah. while you're watching? So we are, we are building an optogenetic tool to do this. So, so we've uh, successfully built in the lab acting crosslinkers, which are optogenetically controlled. And so I think we now have a good handle on, on how to make those uh, also for membrane to cortex attachment linkers. So this is ongoing work. Okay, great. I think we have time for one more question before we go to the informal session. Um, from Adam, Adam Shallard um, about Breun microscopy. Are there issues about um, scattering because of the hydration state of the sample? Yes, very much so. And so, so there's, there's a lot of discussion in the field about exactly what it is that we are measuring. And so we've been focusing on extracellular matrix uh, because we have interest from other projects in the lab on, on ECM mechanics. Um, but there is a lot of discussion about water content and, and how water content affects it. And I can tell you that if you like cosmotically shock the cells, your shift goes completely awire. And so it's clear that one has to do very controlled experiments for that.